If you've seen my video on Hereditary, you'd know that Ari Aster is one heck of a director when it comes to using subtle misdirections and ambiguity to manipulate the audience and create suspense. Well, he does that again in Midsommar, but by using auditory and visual cues specifically designed to place you in Danny's shoes. And I don't mean the typical immersiveness where you feel like you're part of the story, although that happens as well. In Midsommar, Aster presents a completely separate set of cues that Danny might have no clue of. Is it scary? In order to characterize and ultimately plant in us the more profound and unconscious trauma of Danny. Of course, to do that, these cues must be hidden like a real trauma. And like a trauma, we must start from the beginning. Here's a question. What's the very first shot of Ms. Omar? No, it wasn't Danny in her room or the shot of her parents. It was this, a drawing that foreshadows everything that's going to happen. If you got this right, good for you. If you didn't, don't worry, because the shot only lasts for about 20 seconds. But in that 20 seconds, we see the death, the mourn, the departure, the settlement, and the celebration Miss Omar will bring to Danny's life, even before we meet her. And although we don't have the specifics, we can at least sense that none of these stages are particularly uplifting. The colors of the drawing gradually brighten up, but the character, the personality of it stays consistent, with the last image being just as unsettling as the first, if not more. And then, instead of dissolving or cutting to black, the image opens up, mimicking a curtain, inviting us to witness the dark fairy tale that is the drawing itself, the drawing that is available only for the audience, irrelevant to the ego of the characters thus far, the visual that is both elegant and menacing, and the audio that's both heavenly and psychedelic. You may have forgotten about the very first shot, but nobody forgets about the very first scene. After the short 20 second segment, we arrive at Danny's apartment, where she is trying to get in touch with her bipolar sister after receiving a suspicious message. Unfortunately and eventually, we are greeted with gruesome deaths of Danny's sister Terry and both her parents. Many consider this opening one of the best parts of Midsommar. And indeed, the tempo, the cinematography, all the way to the reveal are flawlessly presented. But something that's often overlooked from this scene is the way Aster's team uses the score. The entire scene lasts for about 12 minutes. And in that 12 minutes, Aster uses five major sounds. The 15 second long intro score, an unlisted vocal track, a telephone ring that cuts that track, and finally, two major scores, of which only one of them are clearly audible. In other words, after the hauntingly beautiful opening score that sets the tone, no proper music is heard for almost nine minutes. It's true that inserting an appropriate piece of music has the potential to accent an existing atmosphere. But if you can correctly remove a sound, it will create an atmosphere. Hey, hey sweetie. The vocal melody that follows the first score works as an extension of that score, carrying the established mood and reminding the audience of that first stage. Winter. In essence, the film is saying, once upon a time. The ringing of the phone intentionally hijacks the singing because that's when the actual story begins, where the audience is abruptly pulled in and told, there was a girl. Just like that, we're locked in. For the next five minutes, no music is played to force an emotion. In fact, the lack of music is what intensifies the scene because we're given no clues about where the story is headed next. Of course, except for the unconscious knowledge that whatever happens next probably won't be graceful. The first real score enters when Danny receives the phone call that will turn out to be from the cops, informing her of her family's death. But this one is deliberately played down to ease the audience into the upcoming climax. And the score remains half hidden in the mix as an ambience when we cut to Christian and his friends having a conversation at a restaurant. And then... Hey. When Bobby Krulik's incredible score, Gassed, finally hits, 
presenting itself at the front of the mix, it does so by supplementing our reaction, not forcing it. It functions as a description of the visuals, with the strings and other effects mimicking the siren of the ambulance, the leaking gas, and even Danny's cry. Yeah, this soundtrack features Danny's actual cry, blended into the mix like an instrument to enhance the dread. And because the sounds we anticipated to hear from the visuals are muted, the score that imitates and replaces the ambience feels more compelling. And by the time we hear the zipping of the body bags, and with the track becoming increasingly melodic, the line between noise and music gets clouded, both functioning as each other. Nothing exists outside the world we see. Everything we hear is everything the scene produces, a one-to-one -one correspondence, carefully timed to match the visual sequence. What it isn't is Danny's experience. Danny wasn't at her parents' house at the time of their death. Truth be told, she probably never even got to see them the way we did. So technically, she never saw this. Yet, Aster continually uses this exact image through the course of Danny's journey, either as a part of her subjective experience or as a superimposed image hidden in the background. It's crucial that we don't get stuck in a loop here trying to come up with a logical reason for how Danny may have gotten that image in her head. Danny is a character who has lost her entire family. It doesn't matter what image she has in her head, it's all traumatizing. What matters is the experience of the audience. For us, the only transferable quality of Danny's trauma is the daunting image of Terry. Therefore, to keep us in sync with Danny's suffering, Aster recycles this picture, translating the trauma to a tangible visual stimulus. It's worth noting at this point that, as was with auditory cues, the visual cues are isolated in that they seldom accompany auditory stimuli to navigate our attention to a precise detail that can't really be found. That's how genuine anxiety is created in Midsommar, by mismatching what we see and what we hear, by directing our attention to the screen that hides what we're to see in plain sight. Hey. As a result, Danny's misery echoes with us like no other. When she's aware of her own anxiety, the image is openly exhibited alongside Danny. When the anxiety is concealed but lurking, the image is burnt on the periphery of our minds. Another image that is recurrently displayed is the flashing emergency lights from the night of the incident. There is a moment when Danny is exposed to this light pattern in the opening scene, but again, the vivid lights are less about Danny and more about the audience, behaving as yet another trigger and a reminder of the shocking imagery we had to endure. The second half of the film shifts from spotlighting Danny's trauma to her present confusion and nervousness. The most obvious but adequate example is the trip visuals. To be fair, many scenes featuring this visual effect are meant for both Danny and the audience. But near the end of the film, the effect serves only to elusively put us at the edge of our seats to see and feel what Danny sees and feels. Mm -hmm. <sighs> The effect itself is very subtle. The visuals are easy to miss and are later forgotten amidst all the dances and conversations that take place. By the end, the waving mountains become the new norm and our subconscious accepts the unease to take hold of our inner world. That's why the breathing flower that pulsates with Danny's heartbeat can easily go unnoticed. Despite the pronounced motion of the flower, speeding up and slowing down with Danny's fluctuating mental state, the illusion is nearly imperceptible due to the rest of the deceptive movements elsewhere on screen, sustained for an even longer duration. It goes without saying that Danny can't see her own crown, so the beating of the flower, even if undiscovered, is there to affect and pressure the audience to feel restless. If you watch the film with this mindset, you'll catch that many of the audiovisual trickeries that felt normal at the time aren't really normal and wouldn't have worked in any other context. The exaggerated radio blur that accentuates Danny's shock, for example, could have seemed cheap and overdone. But thanks to the meticulous buildup and the unique plot point that involves the characters ingesting psychedelics, the blur perfectly fits in. 
isolating Danny and reviving the theme of loneliness while implying that anxiety is a subjective nightmare that is impossible to fully communicate and share. And that's the genius of Astor's directing, his ability to draw us into the psyche of his characters, forbidding us to stay grounded as spectators. If the primary method for achieving this effect in Hereditary was through omission, Midsommar does it through insertion. And rightfully so, because anxiety always involves the intrusion and recurrence of unwanted ideas. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking around till the end. This one was so much fun to make. I recently received my beautiful collector's edition Blu-ray of Midsommar from A24, so I had no choice but to make a video on Midsommar to celebrate. There are countless videos and articles on how Midsommar foreshadows what's to come, so I intentionally avoided discussing such topics, but I may do that on my booklet, which will be available on my Patreon page for my supporters, so stay tuned for that. Otherwise, thanks again for watching and always be sure to keep your mental and physical health in check, especially during such hard times. Maybe don't watch Midsommar like I did. Anyways, stay active, stay safe, be creative, and that's it for me.